say. And so I think for me, you know, it's funny, some people will read the book as a book about PTSD and none of the, none of the characters have PTSD, mm-hmm. right? I mean, there's some characters who have clear symptoms of combat stress, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, it's, you know, the concerns uh, are much broader than that. You know, the, you know, one of the things I was talking with a, a veteran with with PTSD about this, and it was just like, you know, you look think about the war. Like, are you are you mad? Are you uh, do you feel betrayed? Are you bitter about some of the ways that policy has played out over the past two decades? Right? And then it's like, well, oh well, maybe you know, maybe you have PTSD, and I hope that there's a pill that can cure that. And it's like, no, like. Are you an American citizen who doesn't feel pissed off and bitter and just furious about the way that that, that uh, our military policies is, is, has played out over the past two decades? Like, if you don't feel that, well, then I hope they find a pill that could make you feel that because um, it's not healthy. So you've written elsewhere that ultimately it's deeply important for service members to be able to feel that their sacrifices had a purpose. Um, yeah. And on the note of the Iraq war, there's kind of a consensus view building in America, or like a widespread view at least, that the 2003 invasion of Iraq was a mistake. And even beyond that, many of the small victories or accomplishments of that war were then undone um, Mm -hmm. in 2014 time period with the rise of ISIS. Around the same time, you were publishing Redeployment. So how does a service member who fought in that war, based on your own experience and your uh, experiences talking with others, how does a uh, Iraq war veteran um, make sense of their own service in that war? <laughs> yeah, I've written whole long essays about this. Uh, <laughs> I mean, people do it in different ways. But, uh, you know, there's some people who are like, you know, I fought, you know, we fought for each other. There's some people who are sort of like, well, we did our part. And, you know, uh, it's up to them now. Uh I don't think uh, I don't think either of those are fully sufficient, right? Because you know you have a responsibility if you invade a nation um, <laughs> to, to 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 not lead it into absolute chaos, right? You it's 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 not really enough to say, well, you know, we tried, but uh, Oh, you know, the Iraqis screwed things up. It's it's their fault, especially when a lot of the things that happened, pretty much all of, you know, most of the things that happened were predicted uh, beforehand. Um, you know, it's not like some of the challenges that we faced, that there weren't people saying that, that those were precisely the kinds of things that might happen uh, if we invaded Iraq. And then as far as, you know, sort of we fought for each other, I think that that is true in some sense, right? Um, but... <laughs> Nobody, nobody wants to go to war. So we'll, let's have a war so we could just fight for each other, right? That's not, that's not, that's not really how it works, or at least it's not how it should work. And I think if we as a country are not giving service members something broader than that, that's a serious problem. It's a national failing. It's not a failing at the level of the soldiers, right? The uh, the situation that we find ourselves in now is where we have this kind of strange impasse where policymakers seem to be my reading is policymakers seem to be afraid if you pull out too much from these regions things can really spiral into chaos right and they don't want to have something similar to what happened with the pullout in iraq where you have the rise of isis right where you have a kind of total collapse in areas that that, that uh, we had thought were more secure and at the same time uh, and that's unpopular right when that happens uh, the public doesn't like it but at the same time, we don't want to have a debate about the war because these wars that have dragged on forever are not particularly popular. And the public doesn't have a lot of faith in the military when they tell them things are going well for good reason. Uh, and so instead, what we've had is policymakers not being particularly transparent about the wars, right? This is not just something that happened in the Trump administration. I remember being in an event with uh, Ambassador Susan Rice in 2015, 
uh, and you know there was there were a lot of active duty military. There were generals and and uh, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was there, and there were a couple of severely wounded wounded troops, right? Like guys missing legs, guys who had severe burns. And she was introducing the people at this event, and she said, "You know, one of the pr- our proudest accomplishments in the Obama administration is ending the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan." Right? Mm-hmm. And somebody in the audience went, Poof! "I was like, what? there are no video cameras here. Like, who who are you lying to? Are you lying to the two, three, and four star generals in the room who know that that's BS? Are you lying to?" these severely injured troops, like what, or are you just lying to yourself? And, um, during that period, um, the period when we were cutting non-military forms of assistance to Iraq, we were slowly ramping up, uh, military assistance, special, you know, military advisors. We weren't talking about it. We were claiming they weren't boots on the ground. We were claiming they weren't in combat, though they sometimes ended up in combat situations. And there was, some weird tap dancing to pretend that that wasn't still being at war. And, you know, right now we have a situation where there's no transparency that, you know, the Pentagon is not giving out press briefings. And it's this sort of thing where, you know, the military seems to think that they have no obligation to be transparent about the war because it's not popular when they talk about it. And yet they still want, they get frustrated. You know, H.R. McMaster recently uh, was claiming that there's this war weariness narrative that's out in the public that is, you know, hurting the troops, that we have a strategy that uh, is sustainable in Afghanistan and so on and so on. It's like, well, nobody's actually making the case for the war in Afghanistan. And you're not allowing us as a public access to what you're doing. And we're not having you know, the military making a case for the strategy or explaining it to the American public. And I'm sorry, like, even if, even if you want to accept his arguments about the sustainability of, you know, the war in Afghanistan and the sort of cost benefit analysis of, of keeping troops there, if you're not selling it to the American public, then you don't get to have a war, right? This is a democracy. And it's not entirely, it's not really necessarily fully the military's fault, right? Because ultimately it's our political, civilian political leaders who are supposed to be making the case for the war, right? Not the military itself. That's a dangerous road to go down. But in this kind of total vacuum of of any sort of serious discussion about the war among our le- elected representatives, the military's response seems to be to cut down access, um, be less transparent, and then annoyed that that doesn't generate uh, public support for what they're doing. And I'm sorry, but that's not how a democracy is supposed to work. So so you're saying that like, you're saying that service members are making sense of their purpose by saying, oh, I'm, I'm doing my duty. I'm serving. I'm, I'm like doing my part and I'm fighting for my brothers alongside me. But that's not enough when you don't have a serious national interest and investment and engagement with the war. And in part, that's due to the fact that our civilian policymakers and our military are not allowing for a frank and open discussion about the war. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things that everybody in this space kind of harps on is the fact that we haven't had, uh, you know, authorization of military force. And, you know, I, I would think, you know, like the, 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 the founders initially wanted us to have it like it go up for a debate every two years to maintain a standing army, right? Right now, we don't even have a debate about having a standing war, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it would be reasonable to force the president every two years to go before Congress, articulate, you know, where we're killing people overseas, what the goal of the mission is, what the sort of you know, desired end state is, and what the benchmarks of success are so that we can actually hold them accountable, what it would take to resource the mission. And then I think everybody in Congress should freaking vote on it, right? And that seems like a very small thing to actually expect to have happen if we're going to have a long standing war. And yet nobody wants to do that because uh, I think there's a general sense that it's a hard, it would be a hard vote. It'd be a hard thing to articulate. Right now, our strategy is not particularly coherent. It's pretty obvious that when you look at what the generals say is necessary for long-term success versus what we're actually sort of resourcing in terms of the mission, it's not sufficient. And we kind of 
exist in this bizarre space where you have no public engagement about the war, but you can't actually, but it seems like it's impossible to draw things down because we really don't like the consequences of that. And so, you know, one way or the other, there are going to be sort of hard decisions that have to be made. And we've set things up such that at every stage, people are making what are the, in the moment, the most politically easy choices to make. And that is no way to run a war. And I mean, and the reason that it is politically easy to not have those votes and not have those discussions is because there's no popular demand for those kinds of discussions. And I think a lot of people listen to read your stuff or listen to what you have to say, and they think like, wow, I actually think that pu- public engagement with the wars would be a good thing. And I, I would like to know what I can do to kind of like build that sense of engagement myself, you know, just as a citizen. Mm-hmm. And what can you do? Yeah, like what what can a, one of our civilian classmates, a civilian listener of this podcast, what can they do to foster that sense of engagement? Sure. I mean, for that, it depends on what particular aspect of engagement with wars you care about the most, right? Um, if, if it's veterans issues, there's a host of different types of organizations uh, and causes that you can link yourself to and join and support. If it is... Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. An organization that I've been involved with is Veterans for American Ideals. It has veterans advocate on Capitol Hill every uh, every year for um, tying American policy more closely to the sorts of ideals we fought for. Uh, and one of the things that they've been focusing on is immigration, refugee issue, is, issues, special immigrant visas for interpreters, that sort of thing. Right. That's you know, a fairly narrow aspect of, you know, this broader discussion, but it's, you know, one area where, uh, you know, I've sort of tried to do something and whatever it is that is sort of most resonant with you, right? Because if you look at the problem as the entirety of the problem, it's, um, it's very easy to feel overwhelmed. Um, if you look at it as what is the specific issue within this, where it is possible to move the needle and where there are organizations and groups that are already doing good work, moving that needle, you'll find that there are a million ways in which you can make uh, impacts, right? More broadly, I think that sort of insisting upon, especially if you're a civilian, insisting upon your right to be engaged in civil military national security discussions and insisting both sort of to anybody you mean but also especially with political figures that you know this is an area that we need to be more responsible where we need to actually structure how we how we approach these issues in such a way that we force our elected leaders to take hard decisions i think that's something that we should advocate for chicago the windy city the city of broad shoulders the second city is complicated Known for its legacies of segregation and political corruption, Chicago has a lot to grapple with. On Chicagoland, we bring you conversations with activists, journalists, politicians, and others who are working to address these issues. You can find Chicagoland wherever you listen to podcasts. From University of Chicago Public Policy Podcasts. This is Chicagoland. I think underlying this entire discussion is something you talked about in your Brookings essay on The Citizen Soldier. You quote military ethicist Martin Cook saying there is an implicit moral contract between the nation and its soldiers. Could you kind of walk through what that term citizen soldier means as well as the term implicit moral contract? (laughs) At the beginning of the Republic, we thought that, um, uh, you know, citizen soldiers were going to be the greatest soldiers there could be. Right. So that, you know, there were. There were different two types of soldiers. One was like a mercenary, right? Base mercenaries who, you know, were just out there for the money. And uh, <laughs> Jordy, I, I have a bit in in uh, George Washington's message to his soldiers before the first major engagement of the Revolutionary War, the Battle of Long Island. Remember, officers and soldiers, that you are freemen. Remember how your courage and spirit have been despised, introduced by your cruel invaders, though they have found a dear experience at Boston, Charleston, and other places. What a few brave men contending in their own land in the best of causes can do against base hirelings and mercenaries. 
right? And this idea was like, these guys are just scum. They're just in for the money. They, they're not inspired out of by patriotism and, and moral values. And so, you know, when the fighting gets hot, they're going to flee. And, you know, we virtuous citizen soldiers.